Hey, I'm Sean. I work on Pion. Um, think of it more of like an open source collective for building RTC stuff. Um, the big one is WebRTC, but we've got a bunch of things that we've been working on. First up, I'd like to thank everyone that contributed. It's a project that's just driven by individual contributors. So everyone up here has taken their personal time to go and build something that they believe furthers the community along or builds something interesting. And I would invite everyone in the audience, if they're interested, um, it's very easy to get up on this list. So first we'll talk about Pion and later get into how that ties into WebAssembly. So what really distinguishes it is it's 100% in Go. If you're building anything with WebRTC, um, this is probably brand new. The, one of the nicest things about it is the rapid development and deployment. Um, if you have a small team, you don't want to waste a lot of time deploying your application or fighting things like that. Or, so this is a wonderful little thing that you can just type go build and you can build a single binary. Um, and this binary can target Android, it can target iOS, it can be you know, a large SFU, it can be an embedded device. Uh, we have TinyGo. And it's, that's portable. Like you can, if you write it once, you have all these other places you can go. The other nice thing is since it's statically typed, you have the Go doc. I don't know if you've ever been working on WebRTC stuff, you want to go, hey, what was this specific attribute in the, in the offer options or something like that? It's sort of like a, you have to Google around and look around to find the solution. Since it's statically typed, you can just jump right into the docs. You don't even need to pull up um, the website. You just go doc and right on the command line, you can start listing out everything and jump to it. And the last that I think is really important, and I've started to realize more and more, is the safety of Go. And I don't think this is something that's just limited to Go, there's other languages like Rust that promise this, but Chromium has this rule of two, where only two of these following can be, can, you can have at one time. You can only have untrustworthy inputs, unsafe language, and high privilege. So that means if you're processing network input and it's in C++, you can't have important data going through. And I think WebRTC fails to have, it's this problem space that has all three. We're processing user data and very important private data you know, this is video, this is data channels, these are things that really matter. And we've sort of seen this in industry, we've had a, a couple scary things that have happened in the past year because of the choice of language. So I think it's important. I don't know if Pion's the final solution to this problem, but um, it's definitely one that I care about. Um, if you jump in, I've convinced you, you want to try it out, is an API you already know. So you just call create offer, set remote description, and you're off to the races. Um, the one thing you will notice, it's more of a bottom-up development. It's not a kitchen sink where you download and it has everything available. So if you want to do like an SFU, it doesn't really provide you an encoder out of the gate. Like we have samples that show how to use GStreamer, that show how to use FFmpeg, show how to use whatever you want, um, or libvpx. Like we encourage you to plug in anything and find the best solution. We don't want to tie you to, to one encoder or one solution. We want to be able to you to plug in things and figure out what works best. And that design covers um, Pine itself. So it's 100% in Go, so we implemented everything. DTLS, ICE, SCTP. So all of these individual components are incredibly complicated. But the nice thing about it is if you have a bug in ICE, you can jump right into that. It's debuggable Go, and let's say you're like, oh, the Pion developers really messed up and ICE is broken in this release. You can download the latest version of all these other modules and pin to the old version. We don't break the API. So if you want to roll back and use an old version, that's possible. And there's also logging per component. Um, right now, if you want to log something just related to DTLS, you have to recompile and do all that stuff. Now I just set an environment variable, and all of a sudden I get a trace readout of everything from DTLS. It's very easy to debug and work with other things. Um, and it's an open source we sort of talked about. I encourage everyone to come get involved and figure out like, what it really means to have a community-owned project. So this is our exciting part that everyone came for, is the WebAssembly. So, WebAssembly is new to me, and this is sort of the generic, you search it, this is a definition you'll find everywhere. Um, I was lucky that this work was actually done by Alex Brown from Zero X to add WebAssembly support to, to Pion. So I was, I, this was a learning experience for me as well. So this is the steps I went through. So first thing I noticed is sort of a portable target. You're not gonna be writing WebAssembly by hand. You can have an existing C code and compile it. And you have plenty of other languages, Go, Python, Java. So I went in and I wrote a simple multiply function, take two integers, return, and that was it. Compiled it, went out to a WebAssembly file, look at it, nothing significant. So that was pretty simple. Like that's all it took for me to, to compile my first WebAssembly program. Um, write a little C and compile it. Um, so then reading some more, it's stack-based. It's an incredibly simple VM. Um, there's just a couple primary types, 
you have ints, floats, control flows that you expect, and the ability to call functions. And the cool thing is you can pass in a function to call from the actual WebAssembly. So Python or JavaScript, you can pass in a function that it can call, and this comes, will be important later. So here I am dumping the WebAssembly that I built and showing all the opcodes. So really not that exciting, but you sort of, you sort of see the potential of what's here. Um, we pull two variables, we multiply them, and that's it. And here's what starts to get really exciting for me is that it's not even something you have to pull up in your browser to run. Like it's um, that refresh, retry cycle sometimes get frustrating. This is really exciting to me that I can just download a little, a little virtual machine and run my WASM function that I just wrote. There's no reason that you have to load your code in the browser and test it. You can just sit and run unit tests and stuff right from the command line, which makes it really easy. And then, so from here we sort of diverge, and there's two significant stories with WebAssembly for WebRTC developers. You have the performance people. So you have a lot of people doing super interesting things where they want to process H.264 in the browser. You, let's say you want to completely bypass any sort of other decoder. You can compile FFmpeg to WebAssembly and run it in the browser. You can do computer vision. And when I was searching around, the one that really I thought was fun was someone that has Windows 95. You just go to a website, and you can use a full operating system. It's a really fun blast. And uh, so this breaks down into two parts. Like, there's the, the incredibly fast, you can run all these cool things in the browser, and then the right once run everywhere story. And that's the one that Pion really focuses on. I'll sort of show how we accomplish that. So this is the, an example Pion application, where if you've done any WebRTC before, you create two peer connections, you set your on-ice candidate, and you create your offer and your answer. Um, Hopefully nothing new or too divergent there. And then next, we have an example of the offering side creates a data channel. The answering side, when it gets a data channel, prints it, I got it, and then sends a message back. So right now, we just have, in the same process, two peer connections and them talking to each other via data channels. And let's build it. So all that it takes to build this new application you wrote is type go mod init, initializes the project, and go run and it downloads it from GitHub, and that's it. You have a full application that's running locally that prints out the data channels open, and thank you for flying Pion. And so that's it, like if you wanna build your first application, that's all it takes to build to the data channel thing. You can have two people talking to each other from the command line. So now let's do, take it to WASM. So the Go compiler, all I need to do is pass in two environment variables, the operating system and the architecture, and it builds it out to WASM and I load it into an index.html. And this is the entirety of the file where I just call the WebAssembly web instantiate streaming and fetch that main.wasm I built with the first command. And it's done. So that was all it took. That existing Go code base that we had before, it now has all of this on data channel. Thank you for flying Pion. So gone are the days of having to write your signaling code in multiple languages. And that's where it's really powerful for these small teams. If you have a team of one or two people are an open source project, you're really gonna get loaded down by an Android client, an iOS client, a web client, like those numbers add up to the development time and you have that friction between languages. So this gives me the ability to just do that. So the question is, how's that actually happening? And if I wanted to write a library, this is all it takes. Um, so Pion has the pure Go implementation and then we actually just have a, a, a thin shim layer. So when you import Pion, we have the same, we have this my alert function that runs if you're in go mode, and then we have this my alert function that actually just calls the JavaScript. And so um, when you load up the Pion, it's actually just calling the HTML5 JavaScript library in the browser. And this is also great because we are able to run our tests and, con and prove conformance of Pion because we build it, we run all our unit tests against our Go implementation, and then we build it and run all, all our unit tests against the JavaScript application. So you know that across platform, your application should be behaving the same. And this portability story comes to a lot of places. So I see a lot of people doing mobile. I see there's a couple of people that are exploring like the embedded IoT space with TinyGo. It's a re-implementation of Go that promises to get it on very small microcontrollers. Um, cars and robots, I see a lot of people that they want to be able to just build a binary and throw it on these devices and have them talk to each other via data channels. A lot of SFUs. Like I just want to open up this ability for us to build these things and make it easier. So in the real world, here's some interesting things I've seen built. So this company Strive, um, 
is a fantastic company to work with. Every time they hit bugs, they, they come and communicate, and they're very supportive, so I, I'm really appreciative of them. Um, they have a product where they have a CDN that runs up, and one of the users in the network will download the video file. But you don't want to spend, you don't want to have your other five users download that video file. And so what they do is they exchange that media to each other via peer-to-peer. -peer. So you only have to download it one time. Um, and so for this team, it was fantastic because they were able to go out to the, the web, they were able to go out to Android, iOS, and also smart TVs. Go can compile down to ARM, and they were targeting all of these devices that I had never worked with, I was totally unaware of, and they were able to do that because of that portability story. Uh, here's another one that I think is important, is that Tor has a implementation for WebRTC where they exchange data between peers via WebRTC to do censorship circumvention. And before, it was difficult for them to build for Windows, and so now they have this ability that they can easily build a binary that's reproducible, that's simple to build, and they're able to ship it out to everyone and do Windows and Linux. It's a, um, Cloud Retro, this is a, not as much as a portability store, but just the one that excites me what, this port, what the flexibility can bring. So about a year and a half ago, um, this team of just, I think, two developers built this cloud gaming service and um, at cloudretro.io where you play the game, it runs a emulator on the cloud and they can do Game Boy, NES, all these other platforms, and you just send your input over data channels and it sends the video frames back. And it's all open source, I can just do Docker run, pull down, and, I'll, and all of a sudden I have a, my own cloud gaming service to myself. And it's fun to see all these possibilities to play with other people, to share your frames and stuff like that. Um, and it's thanks to like having something that's so easy to use, and they contributed back and added a bunch of features. And then Pi on Neo. It's an open source project, um, and empower those helping the internet. Like this is used by Tor, this is used by IPFS, we're working on getting a web Tor and implementation. These are all technologies that I care deeply about and I think are important. And I think this is our chance to contribute back and empower those people. And also the ability to gain deep WebRTC knowledge. Like we had to dive in and do all of these things. So this is your chance if you want to uh, get involved. And then even if you don't, like, please send us bugs. We need feedback. Um, even if it's just complaints, I really don't care. I just want to make it better. We've spent a lot of time working on this and trying to make it better for people. Um, so we just need to hear from you. Don't worry that your issues won't be well thought out enough or that, that needs more detail. Like, I just want to suss out the details. So, so thank you very much. And if um, you want to chat, please download the code. And we have a Slack with about 400 people and like 10, 15 actives. Um, we're talking about everything. We're not just talking about Pion, but people are building other projects. They're, they're using other stacks that work better for them, and I just want to encourage a diverse community. So um, if you're interested, jump in there, and I'm always happy to chat. And then the Twitter is like a low-frequency thing that I try to post what's interesting, and uh, just getting started on that. So thank you very much.